All right, well, today is the fifth and final week of our series, Pioneer, and we have been saying this, we are all pioneers because every day of our lives, and in certain specific moments of our lives, we are all stepping into unknown and unfamiliar territory and hoping that our actions and our decisions can and will build a better future. It happens every day that you and I wake up in a day we have never navigated before, and it happens when God leads us into a new season as parents, and in relationships, and in friendships, and at work, and at school, and with that comes excitement and with that also comes fear. And so we've been asking the question, how do we step into God's new with confidence without being crippled by fear? And we've been looking at the example of Joshua and the nation of Israel as they left the wilderness and moved into and took possession of the land that God had promised them. And from the beginning, we've said that the, uh, we've said we can step into whatever God calls us to when we're confident that God is with us, that he's for us, and that he's working through us. And we've learned some incredible things that, like, that God takes full responsibility for the life fully devoted to him. And at the same time, he also puts things into our hands to be responsible with and to be responsible for and when he does, pioneers respond with complete responsibility for our complete obedience to God, and then we trust God to be fully responsible with the outcome of our obedience. So so today, we're closing the series out, and I want to read a very short passage from the book of Joshua. It's one of the last real episodes in the life of Joshua as the leader of the nation of Israel, and in this moment in time, across the end of of one chapter and the beginning of another, we see something very fascinating. Israel has won virtually every battle that they have entered. They have defeated every enemy. They have vanquished every foe because yes, I can use big old English words. And we're about to, what we're about to read is this interesting story about what happened after they had won the land. In Joshua chapter 17, starting in verse 14, it tells us this. The descendants of Joseph came to Joshua and asked, why have you given us only one portion of land as our homeland when the Lord has blessed us with so many people. So in other words, in our tribe, we multiply like rabbits, so we need quite a bit of space if we're all going to live in our land. Now Joshua replied, verse 15, if there are so many of you, and if the hill country of Ephraim is not large enough for you, clear out land for yourselves in the forest where the Perizzites and Rephites live. Now, this is interesting. Joshua had allotted land equally between the 12 tribes of Israel. Some of the land, most of the land of Israel was was empty and desert and flat in New Mexico. We're very familiar with that type of land. This particular allotment of land was about half hill country and full of trees, half desert, you know, and so the, and, and the hill country was thick enough to call a forest. If you live, if you've ever been close enough to, uh, to Rio Doso, to Cloudcroft, you may be familiar with that type of land. So here's what was happening. The people saw the big land. They knew how big their portion was, but instead of seeing and filling the bigness of the land, they had stopped because of the obstacle of the trees and the thick forest. So Joshua reminds them, hey, the land is yours, and if you need some space, all you really need to do is clear out some trees. It was okay because he had checked with all the 1200 BC environmental groups, right? So here's, what, here's what's important to notice. He had given them a lot, and all they saw was trees. For some of us, this is important to point out, for some of us, we fail to notice all that God has given us because we only see obstacles. I want you to understand today that God has given you a lot. Now, not a lot of land, but a lot of life, a lot of blessings, a lot of miracles, a lot of grace, a lot of favor. He has given you a lot, and you might not be able to see it because of the obstacles that come in, in front of you. you there's a, maybe for some of you, there's a lot of love in your marriage, but you might not be able to see it because of normal everyday conflict. And you have blown up the everyday conflict to be like, oh my goodness, we have conflict, we have some big problem. And you can't see the love because of the conflict. Maybe you have, a, you have a lot of talent, but you can't see it because of the obstacle of insecurity. Maybe you have a lot of wisdom, but you can't see it because your friends tend to pull you in the wrong direction. And I just want to remind you, the same thing is true that was same for the nation of Israel. Sometimes you have to clear the obstacles so you can claim the blessing. Sometimes you have to move, you have to clear the insecurity. You have to clear the group of friends that pulls you in the wrong direction. You have to overlook and move past the everyday conflict so you can experience the lot of love, so that you can experience the lot of talent, so that you can experience the lot of wisdom and live out of the blessing of that. Sometimes you have to clear the obstacles so that you can claim the blessing of God. And for the nation of Israel, for this tribe specifically, for the tribe of Ephraim, the descendants of Joseph, Joshua says, you've got to clear the obstacles 
so you can live in the blessing. And the same thing is true for some of us today. We've got to clear the obstacles that get in the way of us seeing and receiving the blessing in order for us to actually obtain and live in the blessing of God. Now, verse 16 tells us this. The descendants of Joseph responded, It's true that the hill country is not large enough for us, but all the Canaanites in the lowlands have iron chariots, but those in Beth Shan and its surrounding settlements and those in the valley of, uh, of, of Jezreel, they are too strong for us. Now, this is interesting. This is a group of people that has virtually never lost a battle. And they go, but these guys, they're too strong for us. So in verse 17, then Joshua said to the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, the descendants of Joseph, since you are so large and strong, you will be given more than one portion. He says, the forests of the hill country will be yours as well. That's already what I've given you. I'm just saying it as if I'm doing something else. The forests of the hill country will be yours as well. They already belong to you. Clear as much of the land as you wish and take possession of its farthest corners. And you will drive out the Canaanites from the valleys too, even though they are strong and have iron chariots. This is also already your land. You have to go clear it. You have to clear the enemies. You have to clear the obstacles. But your land is your land. And as long as you'll go claim it, it is is yours. Here's what Joshua is really telling the people. You've seen the walls fall. You've seen rivers stop. You've seen God go before you every step of the way. You've seen God come behind you to protect you in your rear every step of the way. You have seen the sun stand still. You have displayed a lot of confidence in God that he can win any battle, but God has a lot of confidence in you and this land that he's given you. He knows that if you will clear it, you can claim it. This isn't a matter of if you can, this is a matter of if you will. And if you're willing to face them, you can defeat them with God by your side. God has a lot of confidence in you, just as much as he's asked you to place your confidence in him, he now is placing his confidence in you that if you will, you can. And if you will, you will receive the blessing and the land that God has given to you. Now, the story continues into chapter 18. In, 18, in chapter 18, verse 1, after settling the, the, this difficult issue for the, for the Ephraimites and for the descendants of, 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 of Joseph, the, 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 the rest of the, of the tribes of Israel come to Joseph as well. It says this in verse 1, Now that the land was under Israelite control, the entire community of Israel gathered at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle. But there remained seven tribes, seven tribes who had not yet been allotted their grands, grants of land. Now, that's kind of a bad translation. The actual translation had it, it more so means they had give, been given an allotment of land, but they had not yet gone and settled their land. History tells us this. It wasn't that they had been, hadn't been allotted or assigned. It was that they hadn't gone to actually live there and possess the land. They, have, they hadn't gone to make it their home. So what we have is this picture that God has given them the entire land, It's been allotted to them. They've been given the north. These guys have been given the east. These guys have been given the northwest. These guys have been given the southeast. They've been given the land. They haven't gone and taken it yet. And so then Joshua asked them in verse 3. This this is an incredibly powerful, powerful verse. Then Joshua asked them, how long are you going to wait before taking possession of the remaining land the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has given to you? How long are you going to wait? Like God's given us this entire land and we're all gathered together and hunched together right here. He, like, like what, are, what are we doing? Why haven't you gone to claim and take possession of what God has so freely given you? Here's what we see in these, ba- these two back-to-back accounts. While their battles had won them the land, their lifestyle had kept them from receiving the blessing that God had for them in the land. I mean, we said this a couple weeks ago. Wherever God leads us, it is good and it is for our good. God has brought them to the promised land. God has given them the promised land. God has given them victory within the land. And now that it's time for them to live off of the blessing that is the land, they have not gone and actually taken hold and possession of the land and began to actually live in and dwell in the land. And Joshua, with his words to the descendants of Joseph and with his words to the rest of the nation, simply says, look, I'm as excited as you are that we have won the battles, but there is more for us to do. There is more than winning battles. There is more than wandering. You have gotten so used to fighting and winning battles that now that it's time to go take possession of the land and live in peace, 
You almost are acting like you don't know how to do it. There is more than wandering. We've wandered for so long. We don't know. You're, you're acting like you don't know how to settle. There is more than crossing rivers. We crossed a river. Yay. We crossed a Red Sea. That's part of our story and part of our history. That's phenomenal. But now there are no more rivers to cross. There is land to settle. There is more than running into fights. And you've grown so used to fighting for the blessing and promise of God. But if you're not careful and if you don't catch this shift, you can miss actually possessing the promise and blessing of God. And if you won't learn to possess it and to live in it and claim the blessing of God, you may in fact live your entire life as if God has not given you any blessings. And what we ultimately see in the people and the nation is an example of one of the most ominous words in all of life and in all of faith, and in fact, some of you, it may be that you have been guilty of, of this at some point in your life. It's possible that you have accused someone else of some of this at some point of your life, but it's the simple word settled. You have, you have settled for something. Just like the nation of Israel, they have settled for living in land that is too cramped in a space that does not belong, like that, 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 that is that is theirs, but is not supposed to be shared be, be, with everyone. They're supposed to stretch out. They're supposed to stretch their legs, stretch their arms, have space to live, have space to plant crops, have space, space to provide for tribe after tribe after tribe. And they've settled into this one tiny area where God has given them this huge beneficial blessing of a land. They have settled for a tiny bit of the blessing. Now, let me ask you this question. Have you ever been guilty of settling in life? Heads up, this would be a bad time to look at your spouse, okay? Just if you're watching with your spouse, bad time to look at that at, at them, okay? That's what the people were doing. They knew that God had given them land to build homes, and they were still clumped together in one spot in tents. God's like, hey, I gave you space to build homes. Why are you still living in tents? Despite knowing that God had given the nation victory after victory, they were afraid to go as a tribe to fight for themselves. They had failed to see and secure the lot because they saw an obstacle of the trees. They as a nation had grown comfortable re with receiving part of the blessing and in doing so had settled for less than the fullness of the blessing of God. And God Joshua says, would you wake up would you, re would you wake up from your settledness? You have settled, but there is more and there is better for you. God has more and God has better for you. And if you will get off your settled butts and move and follow God and walk where he tells you to go and stretch your arms forth and stretch forth your strength and use the strength that God has given you and walk with the Lord your God. There is no victory that you can't win and there is no land that you can't settle and there is no blessing that you cannot receive. So there is more and it is time to go receive it. Let me ask you again, have you ever lived like that? Where you knew that it was possible that there was complete freedom but you had grown comfortable with holding on to a little bit of that same old junk that had held you bound. You knew there was better for your marriage, but you had settled into a comfortable, tense existence. You knew, know it's possible that you could actually move past your past, but you've settled for holding on to the guilt of your past in the middle of your present. You know there's actually more, but you have settled for more of the same. And if I'm being honest, let me just tell you why I love, I, like this verse is so challenging and why I love, and I'm so passionate about this, this portion of scripture. Part of why I'm pretty passionate about this passage of scripture is that when I started getting really serious about my faith in my freshman year of college, and I began to own it for the first time in my adult life, I was excited and I was dedicated to reading my Bible consistently for the first time in my life. And I was serving in a youth ministry at a church. And I, like, I loved life. I was, I was majoring in, in advertising and in communications. At the same time, like I knew that while I was enjoying all of that, where I was and what I was doing as far as my studies and my school were not where I was supposed to be and what I was supposed to be doing. I knew I had chosen to study marketing and advertising while I was supposed to be studying for a life of ministry. And I knew I had chosen the school I was at in direct opposition to the calling and direction I knew I was supposed to be moving. And let me tell you, reading the Bible straight through for the first time and being in inner conflict, conflict with God led me to read everything very carefully. And so about a month into feeling this, this tension big time, I stumbled across Joshua 17 and 18. And I remember reading Joshua 18 and 3, and, and very few scriptures in my life have ever just absolutely stopped me in my tracks. But Joshua 18, 3, it stopped me in, in my tracks. And I remember those words, reading those words, how long are you going to wait before you take possession 
of everything meant for you. And I felt like although they were written over 3,000 years ago and spoken over 3,000 years ago, that they were meant for me in the middle of my dorm room in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. This was honestly the verse that broke the log jam for me. It, it, like just, and, I, and I'm going to tell you, I am normally a guy that like I will read and then I will finish and I, whatever it is that I'm reading. And then I might come back and write a few thoughts down about what I just read. I was stopped cold like mouth open, jaw on the floor, dumbfounded. I knew in that moment it was time for me to stop settling outside of God's plan for me, outside of God's best for me, outside of God's purpose for my life. This was where I decided that I would not be content with my good ideas if they weren't God's ideas. This was where I decided that I wouldn't settle for a great career, even if it, if it wasn't a God career. This is where I decided I was all in because I didn't want to settle out of everything that God had for me. I decided I was going to keep pushing and keep pushing and never stop pushing. I wasn't going to settle for anything less than God's plan and God's promise and God's presence in my life, that I wanted to know with certainty that God was with me, that God was for me, and that God wanted to work through me. And I knew that the only way that I could ensure that God was with me, for me, and working through me was to make sure that I never settled for anything less than the best and, the, the, and everything that God had for me. And so here's the bottom line. And here's why I tell you that story. Here's why I read this scripture. Here's why we close out the series with this. is simply this, that pioneers don't settle for anything less when we know that God has more. Pioneers don't settle for anything less when we know that God has more. We could, we could put it this way. Pioneers go forward to settle without ever settling. Pioneers, we, we walk into the unfamiliar and the uncertain and the unpredictable and the unknown of, of, of this and this and this is unfamiliar and this is unknown and it's uncertain and it's still undecided. And so there's fear and there's excitement and there's all of that. And I move forward with that hoping to build a better future. But when I start to see the, the better future, I don't stop there because, I, because I've experienced a little bit of the blessing of God. I keep pushing and pushing and pushing to live out everything that God has for me and to see, see and experience everything that God has for me and to see every bit of blessing that God has for me come to fruition in my life, in my marriage, in my parenting, in my career, in my education, in my neighborhood, in my friendship, in wherever I go. I want to see and experience everything that God has for me, and I never want to settle for less when I know that God has, for more, has more. And it is my hope for you and for your family and for me and my family that we would live content with whatever God has given us, but we would also never settle. That we would live content with whatever God has for us and wherever God has placed us and doing whatever God wants of us. And that at the same time, we would never settle for anything less or anything short of anything outside of God's best and God's fullest and God's ultimately good for you in you and through you. And so today, I want to tell you five things where I feel like maybe just maybe we need to be reminded that there is more when it comes to what God has for us than maybe we have, we're in areas where maybe just maybe it's possible that we have settled. And so the first one is simply this, that there is more to church than Sunday morning. There is more to church than Sunday morning. I am so glad when people come on a Sunday morning, Sunday morning is important in the life of a church. Gathering for, for teaching from, from the word of God, gathering for worship and prayer, it is important in the life of a church, and I think it's important in the life of people. And for a lot of people, I think maybe even most people, church starts with a Sunday morning, but I never want us to just settle for Sunday morning. See, the truth is, every one of us needs church to be more than Sunday morning. It's supposed to be more than teaching, more than an introduction to the Word of God, more than the only time we worship on a Sunday morning. Someone once said that, someone said this a while ago, and I thought this was so incredibly important. They said, some people live as if church attendance is the ceiling, but church attendance is the floor. It's, it's, it's not the ceiling. It's not the highest calling. It's the floor. It's the bare minimum. We should be in church. But if we want to experience everything that God has for us as the church, it always requires more than a Sunday morning. It requires being involved in community. That Jesus gave us a whole bunch of one another commandments, a whole bunch of, you know, this is, you're supposed to do this with one another and do this for one another and forgive one another and encourage one another and challenge one another. And you know what's true about all those things? You need another in order for you to one another. 
You need another in order for you to want another, which is why the church has to be more than just a Sunday experience, just a Sunday online experience, just a Sunday in-person experience. Like It has to be more. This is why in the New Testament, uh, the, the author of Hebrews challenged us with this. He said, let us think of ways to motivate one another. I mean, like you, again, you got to have another in order to motivate one another to acts of love and to good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And for some of us, we, we, we've gotten very content with like, well, guys, I'm doing pretty good. Like I'm attending church. I just, like, I'm there like two out of every four Sundays or I'm there, I'm there three, like, hey, like I'm, I'm there every Sunday. Whew, I haven't missed one yet this year. And here's the thing, that's great. And I love that. But I also want to encourage us, let's never settle for that because like we said, that is the floor, not the ceiling. The ceiling, in between the floor and the ceiling is a whole bunch of one another's. And in order for you to experience and live out and put into practice what Jesus has taught us with one another, we need one another. We need time with one another. We need studying the word of God with one another. And we need time spent serving with one another. That the one another commandments all require something outside of just a one hour together on a Sunday morning. So there's more to church than a Sunday morning. And in the same way, there's more to salvation than being forgiven of sin. That's number two. There is more to salvation than being forgiven of sin. So you are saved from and forgiven of your sins. That's the starting point. Some of us live and act as if that's the whole ball game, but that is the starting point. That's not where you stay. If all you experience of Jesus is knowing that you've been forgiven of your sins and you'll go to heaven someday when you die, you have experienced something phenomenal, something amazing, but you haven't experienced the fullness of Jesus' salvation. He came to forgive sins so that we could go out to show others his light and his love and his grace and his peace. Yes, he saves us for eternity, but he also saves us for today so that we can turn our today and in the middle of our today, show the world that there is a new and living way today. That he saves us for eternal life, but he also saves us for, for our everyday life so that we can bring other people into, the every, into, into eternal life and into everyday life of Jesus. In Ephesians chapter two, Paul wrote this. He said, God saved you. God saved you. You're like, we could stop there. Some of us, we stop there. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Again, most of us, that's where we stop. It's from God. It's grace. It's nothing to do with me. That's awesome. It's all, it's, it's all just a gift from God. And then, then, but you're like, wait, wait, wait. Uh, there's another verse. He says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. So... We can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You were saved from your sin, but you have been saved for a purpose. You have been saved from your sin. You've been saved for a, a reason. You've been saved for service. You've been saved for ministry. You've been saved for impact. And so there's more to salvation than being forgiven of your sins. It's massive. That's like, the, the, like we go, whoa, that's incredible. But the other side of it is that we've been saved from our sins and we've been saved for purpose. There's more to salvation than being set free from sin. And similar, thing, th similar to that, there is more to freedom than being set free. In Galatians 5.13, it says, For you have been called to live in freedom, to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sin from nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. See, here's something I don't know a lot of pastors tell you. God's responsibility is setting you free. God's responsibility is freeing you, and that can happen in an instant. In the snap of a finger, in the clap of a hand, that's how quickly God can free you. Living in freedom is your responsibility. Fun, fun stuff, huh? And the way we talk about it, so it's like, well, God sets you free, and we don't teach people that you actually have to choose freedom every day. That once God sets you free, our natural inclination is to turn right around and run back to all the same things that bound us in the first place. And it's our responsibility to actually live 
in freedom. God has called us to live in freedom. It's our responsibility to live in that direction. And so we want to live in responsibility. In responsibility. We want to live in freedom. We have to take responsibility. And what Paul is saying there is that in Christ, you have been given freedom and freedom can come in an instant. You can be set free in a moment. He's also saying that we have a choice of what we do with that freedom. Our freedom can be something we live in and serve from, or we can use our freedom in a way that leads us right back to captivity. And just like God's responsibility was delivering the promised land. God's responsibility is the setting free of you and me. Just like Israel's responsibility was learning to live in the promise, it is our responsibility to learn how to live in freedom. And let me just say this, because in Christian circles, we've gotten some things wrong for a while as we've been taught the ideas of small groups and accountability partners and the like. It's easy to hear that and think it's their responsibility to guard your freedom. It is not. It is yours. A small group is valuable, but they are not responsible to God for your freedom. You are. An accountability partner is valuable, but they are not responsibility to God for your freedom. You are. And I hope that you will pursue freedom with everything that you've got and guard it with your life. Don't settle for less than true freedom. Don't settle for the freedom that God sets you free and then you walk right back into captivity. You pursue a life that lives in freedom and never settle for anything less Fourth one is simply this. There is more to pain than the hurt you've endured. There is more to pain than the hurt that you have endured. See, pain outside the hands of a loving God is just pain, and it is pointless. And for some of us, in the middle of our pain, what we so unfortunately do is we go, well, I'm hurt, and I experience some pain, and we blame God for the pain, and we walk away from God in our pain. But when we walk away from God in our pain, we so often miss what God has for us in the midst of our pain. See, pain placed in the hands of a loving God gets redeemed and finds purpose and finds meaning and finds restoration and finds healing and may even find instruction. In, in, in Psalm 34, uh, David wrote this. He said, the Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all of their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous. Not one of them is broken. There is more to your pain than the hurt that you've, that you've endured. And if you will allow God the time, the time and the opportunity to be close to the brokenhearted, to protect your life, to, to, to protect your life that while there is something that is trying to break you, God will not let you be broken. You experience the protection of God, the covering of God, the presence of God, the healing work of God, the restoration of God, the, the gentle whisper where he says, I know you don't want to hear this right now, but I was trying to protect you. When, with that, that voice that you were trying to ignore when you ran in this direction is the same gentle voice that will bring healing to you right now. But I also want to let you know, this is what I wanted to protect you from. And if we'll allow God to speak to us and be close to us in the midst of our pain, there is more to our pain than just the hurt that we have endured. And the final one is simply this. There is more to know of God than you have already known. There is more to know of God than you have already known. In Ephesians chapter one, Paul prayed this for the Ephesian church. He said, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And you're like, if that wasn't enough, he goes on to say this. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That is the power. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. In another translation, it says, I pray that you would know this thing that can't really be known. Like, well, how do we know something that can't fully be known? Well, every single day of our lives, we try to know a little bit more. And we try to seek a little bit more and we pursue a little bit more and we do whatever's within our power to know more about God and to know God more, to walk in an intimate relationship with our creator. There is more to know of God than you have already known. And for some of you, you've been following Jesus for five years. And for some of you, you've been following Jesus for 50 years. And for some of you, you've been following Jesus for 70 years. And there's a lot of wiggle room in there. And some of you, you have been living the same one year over and over again for 40 years of your life. 
You know, like in that first year, I grew and grew and grew, and I came to know God so much more, and you have kind of been living that same way for the last 40 years of your life. And I want you to know, as long as you have known Jesus, as long as you've been following God, no matter how long you've been following God, and no matter how much you know of Jesus, there is more to know of your heavenly Father. And there is more to know of following Jesus than you have known because of this simple truth. There is always a next step with God. That's why we so often talk about our church being a place where people are challenged to take a first step and a next step. That the first step is knowing Jesus in the first place, but there is always a next step because no matter how long you've known Jesus and no matter how long you've followed Jesus, there is always more. There's always deeper. There is always further. There is always a more, a higher awareness of his voice and his presence in our lives. So there's always more for you. And I hope you'll never settle for what you have already known and what you have already experienced when I know and when you know deep in your heart that God has more for you and God has more with you and God has more working through you. So God has more for you. And I pray that we will all be pioneers who never settle for less when God has more. And so here's the, que- the question I have for you as we close our series today. How long will you wait until you begin to possess all that God has given you and all that God has made available for you and all of the blessing that God has for you and the fullness of what God has promised you? And living in the purpose and living out of the talent and the ability that God has given you. And walking in the gifting that God has given you. And hearing the voice of God that God wants to speak to you. How long will you wait until you begin to possess and take possession and take claim of all that God has given you? Let's not be settlers. Let's be people who are, who are content with where God has us now, but we never settle. Let's be people who never settle and push forward and we push forward until we have received and embraced and achieved and grabbed hold of everything that God has for us, everything that he has at work in us and everything that he wants to do through us. Let's be pioneers because pioneers never settle for less when we know that God has more. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, today I simply pray that we would be pioneers, that we would be people who pioneer in the spirit of Joshua that we would never settle for less when you have more. So God, let us never settle for less when it comes to our experience of the church. Let us never settle for less when it comes to our experience of salvation. Let us never settle for less when it comes to our experience of freedom. Let us never settle for less when it comes to our experience of our, of our pain. And let us never settle for less when it comes to our experience and our knowledge of you. Help us to know you. Help us to know your freedom. Help us to know your healing. Help us to know your salvation. Help us to know what you want the church to be in in our lives. And help us to experience the fullness of every bit of that and everything else that you have, have for us. So God, for some of us who have settled into a life that knows some of what you have for us, would today be a, a message and a word that stirs us from that and wakes us from our slumber and kicks us off of our lazy boys and moves us into a place and a position where we are following you and pursuing everything that you have for us. Help us to never settle for less when you have more. And so today I pray that you'd give us wisdom to know what it is that you have more, what area of our life you have more. And God, would you give us the courage to pursue it with everything we've got? We love you. We pray this all in Jesus' strong name. Help us to experience every bit of what you have for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.